and hello good evening welcome it's wednesday night it's the 24th of april the day the envy committee went into some depth on the tobacco products directive and talked a lot about e-cigs tonight uh, in the studio with me well almost in in the big monitor over there we have jerry stimson unfortunately skype is playing its usual tricks with us and it won't let him send video we have no idea why we've been trying for the last 10 minutes to get it there but it's not quite there yet. At some point in time, it will magically appear. But Jerry's here. Good evening to you, Jerry. Sorry, hi there. Hi, Jerry. That good. So everybody can hear Jerry. That's good. And you'll also see in the other rectangular window just beside me in her new position is the effervescent loveliness, the bouncing bubbliness. That is the one and only Sav. How are you doing tonight, Sav? Um, absolutely fine. Did you uh, enjoy watching all that video from Envy? Um, I like the bingo at the beginning. <laughs> yes, we probably should uh, we should mention for those of you that were tuned in this afternoon when it was live, there was two hours of voting bingo going on. Um, all I'm going to say is all in favour, against, abstentions, rejected. And on that note, it's probably a good idea to get into the titles that way. So all in favour, against, abstentions, rejected. And there you go, VT talk as ever was. Now, Jerry, how much of the uh, how much of the Envy committee did you catch during the course of today? Uh, I only caught bits of it, and uh, it's a very mixed bag. There were some good comments from um, a few people that I caught, uh, Martin Cullinan and Chris Davis. There were some things I didn't really understand at all. I couldn't understand what points were being made. Uh, there was a good point from uh, an MP from Sweden, number 46. I couldn't read the name. Neither could I. Uh, but there was another MP from Sweden, Schleiter, who was seen to be very anti snus and rather embarrassed that Sweden was still promoting it. So um, we, we, we can talk a bit more about this in a minute. But, uh, you know, there seemed to be some inroads, although, you know, most of the people I spoke to didn't really seem to be very imaginative or very knowledgeable about the issues. I, th I think knowledgeable is probably the word. Uh, knowledgeable is where, where, the, where the issues arise. I have to say, though, listening through to the whole thing, the impression I gained was that there has been some movement more towards common sense if I, if I can put it that way, um, I've got I've pulled some of the video out. I've got to got to say that it was it ran very very late today, um, and the the stream from Envy broke up. In, in order for Mac uh, viewers to be able to watch it, we restreamed it. So I've got to, got the recording, which is what everybody's been watching, and I've pulled some of the better bits out. But did you get the impression that perhaps some of the MEPs that uh, you might not have expected to were being a little more conciliatory uh, around about e-cigs and stuff like that. Uh, did, 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 did that kind of occur to you? Because I just got the feeling, for instance, that Linda McCavan, um, in her bit on e-cigs, was nowhere near or didn't seem to be as, as near to wanting to crush them underfoot as she had last time we heard her speak. Did you get that same impression? I didn't hear McCavan, but uh, certainly listening to Chris Davis, I mean, a very, you know, quite a passionate plea about e-cigs helping to save lives. Mm. And listening to Cannon, I think we've got an example of how the advocacy is working. I mean, you've been in contact with him. I know others who've been in contact with him. Mm -hmm. And some of the wording was so rather close to what you might say or Clive Bates might say so yes you know, it shows you can get through to people I know there's been a, a lot of effort there needs to be more effort but um, I, yeah I, I, I think we might get somewhere on this one um, even if it's only the tr I mean I think I think the thing is to try to kick it into the long grass so that you don't get them to make a bad decision now, but you persuade them 
that it's better to leave it for now and to do more research and get more evidence, more investigation. I mean, that would maybe be, be my hope. I mean, there are cracks occurring, I think. There are some advances, and that's everything to play for because the worst thing is that they just pass this as it is. But the more doubts there are about these things, the better, and the more they delay, the better. Yes, I, 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 I agree with everything you've said there. I've got, I've got what Linda McCavan said about e-cigs queued up. Let's have a listen to it and see whether there are any clues in there because what you were saying about touching things in, uh, or booting things into the long grass, I have the feeling that she was almost hinting at that. Let's have a listen to what she said and we'll go from there. Um, another area where I haven't yet tabled amendments is on the whole issue of e-cigarettes. Um, E-cigarettes are tobacco products. I don't, I've heard people saying they're not tobacco products. They are tobacco products. 90% of, um, of nicotine comes from, comes from tobacco. They are a growing segment of the market. And in different EU countries at the moment, they're being treated differently. Some countries require e-cigarettes to be authorised as medicines because nicotine is functionally a medicine. There's no, there's no doubt at all that nicotine is highly addictive, highly addictive. That, that's, that's a given by all the, all the scientists. We're collecting evidence about the vapors from e-cigarettes. Some people have said they're harmless, that there's nothing in them. That is not the evidence we're now collecting. It, it, it's becoming clear that the vapors do, con do contain certain um, carcinogens and heavy metals. However, it's also clear that smokers of e-cigarettes do not, can reduce harm compared with smoking real cigarettes. So there is a lot of evidence for that as well. And so, um, but the problem we've got with e-cigarettes at the moment is there are, there are many different levels of quality of e-cigarettes on the European market. Um, and some of them after when the regulators have looked at them, don't even contain nicotine. So when they've been checked, they've been found to be faulty in terms of whether they had nicotine at all and in terms of whether they worked as delivery mechanisms. So I know a lot of people are getting letters about e-cigarettes. I'm getting a lot of letters. I'm getting a lot of people tweeting me. But just to say I'm not intending to ban e-cigarettes as some of the lobbyists or I don't know who's telling people that this is what the intention is. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm being told. But I do think that e-cigarettes should be regulated. And the question is, how should they be regulated? How can we make sure the products on the market are safe, that they are of, of quality, that the people who are using them know how to use them? Because if they don't work properly, the people who are using them to reduce the harm of smoking will probably give up on them and go back to smoking. We also need to be clear that they are not being used as gateway products to recruit young people into smoking. And we have got evidence in some country that e-cigarettes are being used. Um, on the 7th of May, we will have a workshop in the Parliament on e-cigarettes. The World Health Organization will publish its latest study where it answers a lot of the questions. How many smokers? What's in the vapors? What is the evidence? Are young, who's, who's using e-cigarettes? What's the evidence that young people are using e-cigarettes? We'll also hear at that meeting from regulators from the UK, Germany and Finland who've been looking very carefully at the whole question of how to regulate e-cigarettes. We'll be hearing from um, users of e-cigarettes. And um, so, on, so we, I haven't tabled amendments yet because I want to listen to more of this evidence on the 7th of May. And that's why we've moved the deadline for amendments for this report to the 8th of May, to enable colleagues to hear the, I know colleagues are listening to evidence all the time. There are studies being produced at the moment, but um, we will have that workshop on, on the 7th to listen to the evidence. It's important we get this right. We don't want to release onto the market a new generation of products which are not safe, which do not, do, do not do their function. Um, so, Chair, that, those are the amendments which I have made. I'm looking forward to listening. 
Well, that, that was Linda McCoven um, doing her bit. Um, and it, it, it struck me that she was a lot softer still by no means convinced that she's going to back what we would like her to do, but was definitely a lot softer than the first time we heard her. So I'm going to throw it across to you, Midair, and find out what Chat's been saying, because I have the feeling they'll have been saying quite a lot. Yes, Chat have been incredibly vocal on that. I've just picked out some of the choice comments. Um, Winter Rogue says, She looks like we've given her a headache, to which Cerulean C said she sounds uncomfortable. Sam Rose said, so by the same logic, NRT is a tobacco product too. Mm-hmm. Um, Kronos has said, oh, they've already made their minds up before the studies are finished then. Um, Marco has said, show us the evidence, Linda. Vapor Chris says, she sounds like she's realising the wall of evidence against her is bigger than first expected. Rainbow Vapor says, again, I will say this. If a cow eats 90% oats, does that mean it's not beef? Bad logic. (laughs) Funny Trickster said, I'm all for some regulation, but it needs to be sensible. Doodlebug has said, no, you've got a study from Poland which shows they are not appealing to children or youth unless they are already a smoker. And Russell Orders said, she still seems that she does not want to understand ASICs. She has had the opportunity to listen. She is never going to back them without reservation. I, all of all of that makes absolute sense to me, yeah. uh, Jerry. What 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 do you make of what uh, Mrs. McCavan had to say? Well, that's the first time I'd heard it. I think it would be really good to get a transcript of what she said because there are some really very positive expressions in there where she seems to be recognising that there is a uh, that the e-cigs have a role. And she words like, used words like can reduce harm. Um, make them work better, um, you, you know, it, it was all in, in a sense of, you know, we need to do something to make sure they are going to be there to make them work better. better. Then she got on to the regulatory issue, uh, she says they need to be regulated. Now, that's a bit of a myth because, as we know, they are currently regulated and we need to do some work with MEPs to point out how e are currently regulated by about 12 or 15 different current European Union directives, you know, so yes. it's a myth that they're not regulated. But nevertheless, you know, words you use like quality, quality on the market, um, uh, you know, the, the, those sorts of points um, are, are good. And you know, some of this is going to hinge on that meeting they have on the seventh of May, and who they're going to ask to that meeting. Uh, and uh, I, I don't have any insights in, into that as yet, but I think they're a little bit rattled. I mean, she uh, referred to getting emails and people tweeting and vapors being, you know, representation. So the message is getting through, and that can only be for the good. We're, we're making a little bit of an inroad. It's going to make more, but we're making a bit of an inroad. Road. I think that was very interesting what she said. Yes, indeed. I, actually, I meant to ask you about uh, what was coming up on the 7th of May, this workshop that's going on. Um, I know you've been involved in this kind of thing uh, with, with, with various different bodies. So how quickly is it possible a draft a sensible amendment to something like the Tobacco Product Directive or the Framework Convention or whatever it happens to be, if the workshop is on the 7th and the amendments have to be in by the 8th, there, there can be no sense in that, surely? Um, well, yes and no. I mean, uh, this is really the first time I've been uh, tracking what's going on with, uh, you know, uh, tobacco, but I've been involved in other areas with the UN and people can sit up all night drafting things and they get them, you know, tabled, you know, they, they, you know, it, it can be done, but you have to do the preparatory work and the contacts that people are making at the moment with key MEPs are going to be very important so that they are informed of what the issues are and even going so far as send in to them, if they're receptive, send in them draft amendments. Because you're doing a bit of the work for them, you can't tell them this is what they've got to table as an amendment. But for example, if you go onto Clive Bates' blog, whole series of suggestions there. Clive's wonderful. I was with him last night at a very bizarre meeting, but I'll tell you about that later. But uh, um, uh, 
pushing those to them, if they get draft amendments from different directions, I know other people are doing draft amendments as well, but if you can get hold of an MEP and say, and get them convinced there are issues here, get them a draft amendment, well, you know, you're doing some preparatory work. So your question, can you get something done between a workshop on the 7th and a deadline on the 8th? You can if the groundwork has been done and people have sufficiently primed and uh, have done some of their homework. So really what we're saying is, yes, they're going to go to this, what has been described as a stitch up. I, 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 as soon as I heard it was on the 7th and amendments on the 8th, I thought, yeah, it's a stitch okay. up. <laughs> it's a stitch up looking for somewhere to happen. But if, if, if we as consumers uh, get our acts together and get information through to everybody that's going to be at this workshop, in yeah. other words, every MEP on the Envy Committee, and there's something exciting happening on Saturday about that. Um, if we can get information to them ahead of that time, and, and again, personal, put our personal stories together with some suggestions for how this might be amended to make life better for everybody, then they're going to go in with the kind of preconception that we would like them to have. Does that make sense, Jerry? It certainly does. I mean... It's just crucial to keep writing to MEPs, uh, and we've got to come on to MPs in a minute, because the European parliamentary process is a dual track process, but at the moment it's the MEPs who are uh, the target. Now, you know, we don't have to be scientists, we don't have to be professional, you know, lawyers or experts on regulation, you know, the sorts of letters you can write can be, can be all sorts of things, you know, um, I, 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 uh, you know, it can be personal testimony, and that's often very important because, you know, the, the sort of things that people say, you know, I've been smoking for 30 years and I discovered E6 and my life hasn't, you know, it's been wonderful ever since. So testimony, testimony, anything, and you don't have to go into a lot of details about what the directive says. I mean, you can read it if you like, and you can, well, don't read it. Uh, well, yeah, sorry, you can read it if you like, but you could get shortcuts to it by going like on the Clive Bates blog. But um, be, just be persistent, and the more they get, the better. Now, I think there's a lot happening in the UK. I don't know about other countries. Um, if I can just go on a bit, there is a thing about writing to MEPs uh, and tweeting them and all the rest of it. Be polite, don't be rude. I mean, if you put yourself in their shoes, if you're getting slagged off by people, you, know, you kind of think, oh, kind of forget it. I just want these people to go away. So all the time I have in, you know, in the back of my mind that the, the people, you, you, you need to convert people. Mm. You might see them as enemies, but don't see them as enemies because you need to get them on side. And you get people on side by being polite to them and trying to suggest things which are in their interest to pursue. You know, if you can su suggest to them ways forward, you know, like not saying you're completely wrong, you made a, a hash of this directive, but you say, well, look, it's a little bit soon to make a decision, maybe delay, maybe postpone. So think how, you know, it's like negotiation, think about how you might want to get somebody on your side. Don't go head on, don't argue, don't be rude. Um, so, you know, and there are tips about this on, on Clive Bates' um, uh, blog as well. Well, it, it, it's true to say that the biggest advocate for any cause is the convert to the cause. Yes. That's always been the case. You've just got to look at ex-smokers that packed in under cold turkey. And yes. just listening before the show started to all of the ones in the Envy Committee that, that started by saying, I am an ex-smoker. I used to smoke 45 cigarettes a day of relapse. <laughs> and now I could not, you know... and. All of them, they're all of the ones that were kind of really, really anti, the ones that have been converted to the clean life. And it, it yeah. does seem to me that if, if we can convert, and you never hear me use that word, but if we can convert some of these MPs to our way of thinking, there's going to be no better advocate. You've just got to look at, uh, at Chris Davies. Uh, and in fact, when we come back after the adverts, I'm going to play two pieces of video back to back because... We did say in the teasers for the show that it wasn't all doom and gloom, and really, it's not. You've just got to hear Martin Callanan and Chris Davis together, and honestly, you'll need a tissue. We will be back 
in a couple of minutes uh, straight after these adverts. In favour? Against? Abstentions? Rejected. If, if you weren't there, you wouldn't know. Um, I'm going to go straight into this. Now, we've heard from Linda McCavan, and that was a little bit positive. Here's Martin Callanan, and this guy talks sense. On to the uh, thorny issue of uh, electronic cigarettes. Um, I've looked at this quite closely. I attended the first seminar that the rapporteur um, organized and I've uh, had a number of, uh, of concerns put to me by constituents and concerned uh, third parties um, and I, I think there is a, a concern with the Commission's proposal. I'm not convinced that these are medicinal products or that they should be regulated under the medicinal directive. Uh, I think the argument as far as I'm concerned entirely boils down to whether or not they can be regarded as a gateway product for, uh, for other new smokers and I, I, I don't think they're where they are in this case. I think all of the evidence that I've seen so far points out to me that uh, these are substitute uh, products. Um, they can have the results of, uh, of stopping people smoking. A number of constituents, I think, genuinely have written to me um, to say that uh, they would almost certainly go back to smoking if they weren't able to access these products. Um, this is a market that, that's grown up without regulation so far. There's no evidence... Thank you, Carl. No, you're going to enjoy putting your gavel down to me, aren't you? Yeah. The, um, there's no argument uh, that, that, that they, uh, I think, do provide a, a realistic resource for people who want to stop smoking. There's no evidence that they provide any great problems to people's health so far. Uh, the market's grown up uh, empirically. Um, so if there is to be regulation, I don't think the medicines directive is the appropriate uh, avenue for that. There are a number of different directives that already control it, such as the poisons directive, the product safety laws, uh, etc. And uh, we should be wary, I think, of uh, unintended consequences if we make um, the, these products too difficult to regulate for, uh, for the number of small manufacturers that are currently producing them. Then we risk driving people back to smoking um, normal cigarettes, which I think would be an unintended consequence that nobody wishes to see. There are one or two manufacturers, I'm told, who actually want to see them regulated under uh, medicines laws, and they will presumably pursue um, notification themselves because of the advantages that offers in terms of prescribing, tax relief, uh, etc. Uh, I was going to say something about SNUS, but I'm sure Christopher, I've noticed in his place, will probably do exactly that. I think there are lots of arguments uh, to be had uh, on that. I have some sympathy with his case, but I will leave that to him. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Martin. Uh, and that, that there was Martin Callanan. Now, what did you make of that, Jerry? I, I think that's just great. Um, he's talking sense, uh, but he's also talking sense that other people have talked into him <laughs> because there are a lot of expressions there that come straight out of, um, you know, the arguments that I know people have been putting to him. 
medical directive, medical regulation not appropriate, other directives appropriate. I mean, we know, as I said earlier, there's all sorts of directives that cover e-cigs at the moment, from general safety, packaging and labelling, chemical safety, electrical safety, weights and measures, commercial practice, data protection. You know, if there's a EU EC directive there, it kind of applies. It's, you know, so that that was good. That what he was saying about the genuine letters from constituents. You know, that just shows you what you can do. Uh, they're realistic for those who want to stop smoking. No evidence that they have threats to health. There wasn't quite the wording, but uh, uh, um, that um, uh, you know, helping people stop smoking and um, you know, their substitution products. Not a gateway. Lots of good messages there. So I think Callanan is our man, <laughs> and Davis. There'll be others, I hope. Well, Callanan's uh, definitely uh, made my Christmas card list. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, in his saying sensible things, you know, I don't know what his conversion was, but people have worked on him and uh, we've got somebody on side. And so it, it just shows you that, you know, I'd say democracy works, but, you know, people do listen to what people are saying. And that's the whole message here. Indeed, indeed. Sav, have, uh, have chat been happy with Martin Callan? Have they anything to say? Chat have been ecstatic. I've pulled a couple. Jill CB <laughs> said, substitute products, yay. Winter Rogue says, oh, this guy is awesome. Mark Shaw says, at last, put that in your pipe and smoke at McCavin. Madre says, at last, someone on our side. Vapor Man says, at last, an EU member not talking out of his bottom. And Big Craig says, at least it seems this guy is listening. Well, absolutely right. Absolutely. Well, actually, you know, if they were happy with Martin Callanan, if you were happy with Martin Callanan, you are really going to be happy with um, Chris Davis. Now, I've just managed to nip a little bit off the front of this. It was a mad rush to get it all done. But uh, he hadn't heard much about e-cigs at all until... Um, since then, I've, and especially after putting a letter around my local newspapers, inviting people to give me their comments, I've had hundreds of letters, traditional, handwritten letters, um, from people who are former smokers who have used e-cigarettes and have said, I have tried everything. I have tried all your nicotine replacement therapies in the world, and none of them have worked. I've give, gone back to smoking. But these things work. My health is better, I've given up, I haven't returned to smoking. I am, I am utterly convinced of the value of e-cigarettes as a means of preventing people from dying. Simple as that. Their health improves, they don't die. And I think the Commission is utterly wrong to make the proposal it has done on nicotine, replacement, on, on nicotine limitation. I mean, as a result of that, if people don't use e-cigarettes who are hardened smokers, then more people will die. Simple as that. that that's not the Commission's intention, I think, but that's in practice what would happen if their proposal goes through. I've got a letter here from a professor who says, um, I regard electronic cigarettes as a truly disruptive technology. What he means is this is truly disruptive to the tobacco industry. It's, uh, you know, it, it can allow people to escape from their addiction. Um, and on flavours, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the letters from people who've said, you know, after you've been on e-cigarettes a while, you realise that tobacco tastes disgusting. So actually, you know, flavours are things. I mean, e-cigarettes are not tobacco. I don't have a problem with putting flavours in e-cigarettes if it encourages people to use them because they discover even more quickly that tobacco is disgusting and they don't go back to tobacco. So, you know, I'd have the minimum restrictions on this. It will help save lives. Simple as that. And as for the um, issue of young people starting, well, they're just not cool, are they? I mean, they look ridiculous. But if you're a hardened smoker who knows that their health is suffering, doesn't want to die prematurely, but finds it impossible to actually give up smoking, this is the means of doing it. Yes, I want to have his babies. <laughs> now, Jerry, this professor he was quoting that said that e-cigs were a disruptive technology, have you any idea who that might be? I burst out laughing when I heard that because it's the first time I've, I've, I've heard that bit from the committee and that was a letter that I sent to him and dozens of other people um, only on, on Monday, in fact, and I used the expression, I said, the electronic cigarette is a truly disruptive technology. It delivers a satisfying hit of nicotine but without the toxic tar and gases of tobacco, tobacco smoke, etc., etc. 
So <laughs> um, it, uh, it's just amusing, you know, that, that, you know, when you write the right, write the right sort of thing, you know, they'll grab your words and use them, which is great. I think it's absolutely amazing. I mean, in, in both of those gentlemen's oratories, I have heard words that I have seen used, um, whether it be on Twitter, whether it's been in emails, I've been writing to people, whatever it might be. They're actually picking up on the terminology that we use and they're using it in the way that we use it. I was particularly struck with the way Martin Callanan approached the idea of stopping smoking because he made it perfectly clear right the way through that people actually stop smoking cigarettes and switch to e-cigarettes which is I think something that we've got to major on um, we've got to get them to understand and we've got to kind of use that language all the way through I stopped smoking cigarettes and I switched to e-cigarettes that's that's the key that is the key because implicit in that is if you take them away from me i can very easily switch back would you agree with that jerry oh certainly i mean these um you know as a scientist i like to write the long technical letter but uh for meps for journalists it's the the, the personal aspect of this which is is important um yeah you know those testimonies where i you know i I was, as I said earlier, smoked for 30 years or whatever, and I found e-cigs. And the, the things that Chris Davis was saying, you know, these things work. You know, um, if they're not available, more people will die. You know, so the whole framing of this. I mean, the problem is that a, a, a tobacco products directive, as other bits of international legislation, are, are so framed in terms of controlling access because... You know, for years, quite rightly, you've been saying, let's try to stop people smoking. Uh, but with e-cigs, you've got to actually turn it on its head because you've got to enable people to have these things, enable to have them, you know, things that work and that benefit them. So really, the, 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 a directive isn't really the right place for this. You need a kind of a, a pro-new nicotine products re re uh, framework. So, yes. you know, but the fact that they're saying these positive things, and McCavin is saying positive things, it, 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 it is good. I mean, there are other things in the directory we haven't talked about tonight, you know, also, um, you know, are, are pretty daft in terms of um, denying people access to life-saving um, alternatives. Um, but trying to reframe it as health-promoting, um, saving lives, uh, if you don't do this, people will die, people go back to smoking, do you really want that to happen? That's a, that's a big argument. It's very, very persuasive, isn't it? It's very persuasive. Um, I'm going to throw this across to Sav because I, I have the feeling chat might have been trying to make a giggle and put her off her work. What have you been yeah. saying, Sav? I'm being bore bore baited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, I'll, I'll go back through top to my list about what they had to say about Chris Davis. John Spring says, that was brilliant. Thomas B.S. says, yes, he was really brilliant. Vape and Daz says, I have never seen an MEP so passionate as what I have seen with Chris Davis, and I applaud him and believe what he says. John Spring again says, I expected him to start banging the table. Mono Max says, the guy that was sitting behind him was nodding along. Cerulean C says, there it is, hardened smokers. That is such a key thing to understand. Jill CB says, love this man and, and some. Here, here. Seabiscuit says, what a guy. And Mark Shaw said, where does he live? I'll go mow his lawn and clean out his gutters for him. <laughs> that's, that's probably a lot easier than having his children, Mark. <laughs> It, to seriously, just, just in case Chris Davis, MEP, is watching, I, I meant that just as a kind of admiration. It's not a real offer. Trust me on that one. It is, no, that's taken science too far. Um, I have to say that, that yes, all, all of that, everything that everybody's typed in there is, is absolutely right. Um, and I think somebody mentioned that I might be able to make the clips available. I'll do that. I'll upload them onto YouTube. Because I think it would be a great idea, um, maybe on Saturday, to put links to that particular 
those two particular gentlemen and, and any others that I can pull out, and there are more that we could pull out of the whole hour and 46 minutes they went on after two hours of four against <laughs> abstentions <laughs> rejected. I saw somebody was asking about that in chat. Seriously, you had to be there. This was, this was voting bingo. It was ridiculous. At one point, I shouted house. And then Mr. Groot said, we'll need to check that. I thought, no, <laughs> no, no. It's just too much. It's just too much. Um, right, i tell you what we'll do. Just before we go into the adverts, we do got have to make a little bit of balance. Now, people might well remember that we, uh, we tweeted uh, uh, an MEP by the name of Glenis Wilmot rather a lot. And, again, it would appear that it's had some effect. Now, remember what she was like before. And basically, she wanted, in, in my terms, as I was explaining it to somebody, to crush e-cigs underneath her jackboot. Um, make of that what you will. But have a listen now. It's changed ever so slightly. Have a listen. On e-cigarettes. I know this is a really difficult issue, we've had lots of lobbying, and I'm very sympathetic to those who use this to stop smoking. I think it's vitally important. If it helps to quit, that's great. But surely we still need these cigarettes to be regulated. And if it's a smoking cessation product, that's how it should be regulated. In many countries it is, and in some member states it's already done that way. But what we do need to do is we don't want to see these banned because if they help people quit, we sh that, that's fantastic. What we need to do is have a look at a longer transition period uh, so that they have time for authorisation. I think that would be a, a good way forward. It will be interesting to listen to the arguments when we get to the hearing, and I certainly will be wanting to hear both sides of the argument along with everybody else. Um, but, there, the, you know, I, I think that Chris got a little bit... Uh, over the top there on, on, on his contribution on e-cigarettes. But, you know, I think we have to look at it logically. On e-cigarettes. And, of course, if Glenis Wilmot is going to look at it logically, then she's got really to listen to what Martin Callan and, and Chris Davis had to say. But while she, yeah. while she was talking there, I wrote two things down, two things that raised... Well, one raised the, uh, the joy quotient a little and one kind of raised the hackles a bit. The joy quotient bit came when she said that we'll probably need a longer transition period in order for everything to be taken into account. And that, that's kind of telling me that she'd really rather not do anything now because she thinks she's going to get a kick in if she does. Does that make sense, Jerry? It certainly does. I mean, that, that's what I would like to hear, that... Um, you know, MEPs are saying, well, we don't really know enough about what's going on. We need to delay. I mean, the transition period kind of implies that you've made a decision, but you'll your delay its implementation. But I think we need to unnerve them further that they really don't know enough about what's going on. Now, there was going to be a European Parliament survey of e-cigarette use, uh, well, a summary of surveys, as it were, uh, there was a consultancy company which was going to be commissioned to do that, but they were given such a short period of time that they didn't take it on. And that's really what, in its place, you have this workshop on the 7th mm. where you've got a bunch of public health experts, and I don't know who, although I saw users was in there as well. Oh, yes. I don't have been invited um, uh, to as you know, look at what the evidence is. But... The longer things can be delayed, the harder it is for them to, as it were, clamp down because the bigger the market gets. Just, you know, if you look at the surveys of e-cigarette use, the changes over the last couple of years, e-cigarettes have overtaken NRT in the European Union. So the sales are larger than the NRT. The more companies get established markets, the better because the, the EU is meant to be about harmonizing trade, facilitating trade. So the companies have got an argument. You're going to put us out of business if you make this medical regulation. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to play for time. But yeah, she, um, you know, the, 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 it, it, it was pretty good in a way. I mean, she, okay, she talked about the smoking cessation products, which 
they are not or they don't need to be. I mean, you can make that claim for them, and then certainly you do go through medicines regulation. But if you don't make that claim, they're simply consumer products. So that's, you know, that, that's another argument. And, and Cullinan already gets that, that um, you know, there aren't these claims. It's a switching thing rather than a critting thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, I, th- uh, I, think, um, I think perhaps Ms. Wilmot needs to understand what quit means in terms of switching. And I think yes. uh, some education in that direction might be a good thing. You never know. Yes, could, could, could possibly even happen on Saturday. Who can say? Who can say? Um, so what's happening what's well, Saturday? You'll know about that, but I don't. I, 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 I'm not at liberty to say anything yet. Okay. There, <laughs> are, there are plans afoot. Or good. six inches. I'm I not entirely sure. Yeah. I, look, I look forward to hearing <laughs> oh, I, I think Saturday is going to be exciting. I really do. Um, I'm going to go to the adverts, and when we come back, it's been it's been a week of things moving in the right direction to me because even Ash has come on record and said the good things, and I've got some video of a radio show. Don't ask, um, and I'll play that in. After we come back from the adverts, first I've got to find the adverts. Where the hell are there they are? Um, so we'll have the second set of adverts, and when we come back, we'll have some fun. This is I'm thoroughly enjoying this. And um, but before I do go into the adverts, I want to say thank you to everybody in chat and watching this on video on demand for all the efforts you've been putting in over the last few weeks. It's absolutely amazing. This is the effect that you are having. You. You, kudos, big kisses, slurpy ones, with tongues, adverts. Yes, indeed. Um, we're not going to go straight into the radio show um, because, the, the, as Jerry mentioned earlier, this whole process of what's happening in the EU is a parallel process. There's the European Parliament on one side, they're the elected bods. There's the Commission, which are the unelected bods that come up with the things for the European Parliament to vote on and the likes of the Envy Committee. But then there's a a parallel house chamber, if, if you want to call it that, which is the Council of Ministers. And Jerry, the Council of Ministers, as I understand it, is basically made up of MPs and ministers, representatives from all of the nation states' governments. That's that's correct, isn't it? That's correct. I mean, we're actually doing a little bit of um, a training here in how the um, how the European Union works. But there are yeah, there there are two tracks. There's the, the Parliament, which is the elected MEPs. And there's also the Council of Ministers, which is the representatives of all the governments. And uh, this proposal, as all legislative proposals, goes through a twin track process. It's discussed by the Parliament, by the Envy Committee, by all these people we've heard um, speaking and seen speaking tonight. But it's also going through the Council of Ministers at the same time. Mm. Now, the way to the Council of Ministers is through MPs, to ministers 
in government because it, it, the Council of Ministers is government governments in uh, representatives. So to get to them, you have to get your MPs on side. So you need to get your MP to write to the Minister for Health about mm -hmm. the issue to get the get that pressure as well. I think we've kind of lost um, sight of that a little bit because we've been quite rightly very excited about NV and MEPs because there's a lot of detailed public debate going on there. Council of Ministers, not so public, not so easy to get to, and very much then tied up with government policies. So we need to find out what the health ministers are saying and doing, what representations they're making at the Council of Ministers. Now, all this thing goes on a twin track. Um, the, the process with Parliament, the European Parliament, I think, goes uh, probably go towards Parliament, I think, in the beginning of September. So I guess Council at the same time. Now, it can be that Parliament and Council disagree and there's something else happens then. But can the whole help. point is writing to MEPs is good, but you need to do the same writing to your local MP as well. And when you write to the local MP, also write to your local newspaper, saying what you've written to your MP, get a bit of local publicity, get yes. a lot of pressure there. And I know, you know, local MPs are often very, I mean, in a way, they're more um, accessible than MEPs, you know. They're around a bit more, mm -hmm. uh, they have smaller constituencies, uh, and they're, in a way, more responsive to, to local issues. So don't forget your local MP and find your local MP. As with all these legislators, you go on the writetothem.com website, put in your postcode, and you find your MP. Indeed. And, and I've got to say, if you go to uh, your MP's local surgery, you usually find out where it's held, either from their website or by ringing their constituency office. It's actually quite a pleasant experience to go down. They're usually quite receptive. And if you, you know, take, take, cheat, 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 and Lord above, take, cheat, sheets. If you, it's all right, you laughing, Sav, I've caught this off you. <laughs> oh, take, cheat, sheets if you need them to remind them of what you want to say. But again, tell your story and ask them to make representation on your behalf to the health ministers, to Jeremy Hunt, to Anna Soubry and everybody else. Actually, wouldn't it be strange if... By Saturday, there was a list of all MPs' email addresses and all the NVMEPs' email addresses floating around in the ether somewhere for people to use. Would be interesting, that wouldn't it? But we'll not talk about that. Um, I'm, I'm aware that time's flying. Uh, I'll play this radio show in first, Sav, and then we'll uh, see yeah. what people have to say. Now, I should should tell you, I got asked to go and do this. This is after the Jeremy Vine thing when I. I spoke to their people and got terribly misquoted because they used a phrase that anybody that knows me would know would never come out of my mouth, which was, I found the strength to quit. Rubbish. Let's, let's just say that at some point, yours truly will be doing the Jeremy Vine show. But prior to that, um, myself and Martin Dockrell of Ash did a show. BBC Newcastle 20 to 11. Now... I use an electric cigarette sometimes. In fact, I've got it in my hand now, but I'm not smoking it. I'm just fiddling with it because I need something in my hand. Should electronic cigarettes be banned in public places? Some companies have already outlawed them. There's a, there's a pub group, right? Uh, Weatherspoons. And uh, they say the issue has been dis uh, considered at the highest levels of the company. And they say that due to problems in monitoring e-cigs use, they've been banned because it seems some customers were trying to pass off their real cigs as electronic ones to trick staff. Here's Eddie Gershon from Weatherspoons. It's not a case of not liking them, but we ban them purely because they look like real cigarettes, which is obviously part of the attraction. In a busy pub, it's very difficult for managers and staff to actually see whether it's a real cigarette or one of these e-cigarettes. We don't want to be in a position where our staff are forever coming from behind the bar to police the situation. And there have been times where we've actually gone up and people have been using real cigarettes but trying to pass them off as one of these e-cigarettes. Well, OK, let me go into your bar. Man City have ruled against the use of e-cigs on their premises. Last month, somebody was handcuffed 
at uh, Man City and banned from the Etihad Stadium for using an e-cig. And though this bloke's suspension has now been lifted, the ban on cigs remains in place. And I think, I think, and I'm not sure, it's the same at St James's Park. So are bans like this fair, or are they cutting off a vital lifeline for people who seriously want to give up smoking and just need something in their hands to fiddle with? And when they've got a drink in front of them, you know, they need that something to draw on. Uh, David Dawn is in Sunderland. You describe yourself, I think, as the world's biggest e-cig fan. That's probably true, Jonathan, yes. Why? Um, well, four years ago, um, one of the guys came into the, uh, the practice studios that I was running at the time with what looked like a cigarette at the time, um, and it turned out to be an electronic cigarette. I tried it, liked it, and I've never looked back since. It's all I use now. So um, you, 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 you've you worked in the recording industry, and you used to smoke real fags? Uh, yeah, 60 a day at the time. Okay. Now, do you still smoke? I haven't had uh, a real cigarette in almost four years. That's not to say I've quit, of course. I haven't. I'm still a smoker, but I use electronic cigarettes. I, I still get my nicotine fix. In fact, I've got all of the joys and none of the death. It's uh, a substitute for smoking and right. a very effective one that's a, that's a lot better for you. All right. I mean I, I mean, I think your kind of smoking is more called vaping, isn't it? Because it's, it's you and I have discussed it before. But you, you run a website and a YouTube channel about vaping. Um, yeah. And why has that become such a thing? Well, I think people have realised that well, let's go back to basics. If nicotine had always been served in a, in a pretty mug with a frothy top and cinnamon sprinkles, we wouldn't be having this conversation now because the big enemy has got to be COPD and lung cancer and all of the other nasties that come from the smoke that the nicotine is carried in. The nicotine itself doesn't do any real harm. Uh, the Royal College of Physicians, uh, the MHRA and various other bodies all acknowledge that nicotine and caffeine are basically at two sides of the, the same coin. Mm. Um, so, you know, sitting down and using an e-cig is, is probably no worse for you than having a, an espresso or a latte or, you know, but, other uh, coffee drinks uh, exist. Are you really confident, though, that e-cigs or the, or the, or the bigger versions of the... Uh, I mean, you know, it looks like you're smoking a didgeridoo, to be honest, sometimes. But, I mean, are, are, are you confident that these things are not doing you any harm? Because there's research which goes one way and there's research which goes another way. Well, I can only go really by my own experience and the experience of those people that are close to me. Um, and going back five years, if, if we were doing a gig in, in somewhere like Stales Club in Sunderland, I would get very little of the gear in up those flaming stairs, and I'd have been out of breath and lying on my back and needing resuscitation just about. Um, two years after I'd got into e cigs, we'd get the whole lot in in 20 minutes. I was fitter, healthier, I could breathe better, I can smell better, I, I taste things um, much better now, which, you know, it, it, is all good. Um, I, my experience is there is no problem with e-cigs. So, um, as a super fan of them, can you understand why some places are banning them? No, I think it's a laziness on behalf of Weatherspoons, I've got to be absolutely honest. Um, I do get that if you're using something that looks like a normal cigarette and it's got a red end on it, then, yes, you know, if you're short-sighted and you're busy, um, you might mistake it for a, a fag. But quite honestly, if it's got a blue LED on the end or a, a yellow LED or a green LED or whatever, I'm colourblind and I can tell the difference. Right, mine's got um, a green LED as I, as I pull on it now. Uh, my producer doesn't think I should use it in front of guests, but it, it's not hurting anybody. Well, to, to me, it's, it's, you know, it's no worse than uh, a pommy perfume or body odour or anything like that. I mean, it's not going to do anybody any harm. There's no second-hand smoke from it. There's none of the carcinogens that you would get from smoking tobacco or cigarettes or the second-hand smoke from cigarettes. It's not going to do anybody any, any uh, danger at all. I can't see a problem with it. Well, ap apparently it's not professional. Mm, well. she no, should... I, get, I can kind of get that, but if you go back to the old days, I used to go and see uh, Dr Kelly, and he'd have a pipe on or a couple of woodbines going while I was getting... Uh, getting vaccinated as a child. So hey, listen, listen, David, you and I remember working in studios where the ashtrays were brimming over. Um, do, do, you, do you think e-cigs make, smoke, make smoking look cool to kids in any way? I mean, you know, let's say you saw an eight-year-old um, pulling on an e-cig for whatever reason they might be. 
I don't think, it, no, I don't particularly think a, a one that looks like a cigarette looks particularly cool. In fact, I think they look particularly silly. Uh, they look a bit like toys. The kind of stuff I use might have a cool factor to it because it's a bit more, as you said, like a didgeridoo or Doctor Who's sonic screwdriver. Mm. But even then, we're not talking about uh, an insignificant investment. I mean, the one I've got in my hand at the moment, I'm probably looking at 500 quid in total for everything I've got there, mind you. Um, it's probably the Rolls Royce of, of the gear that's out there, and no, I'm not going to name it. Um, no, I don't think there's a particularly a cool factor. But that said, you know, if, if, if I had a 15-year-old now, uh, and she came in and she said, you know, I've, I've been smoking cigarettes, Dad, I'd be turning around and saying, well, here, have an e-cigarette, because I know that's not going to kill you, whereas cigarettes but, very likely will. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the trouble is, though, you know, you're still ingesting something with an e-cig, and I don't know that this isn't killing me, even though we did a, a small amount of scientific research, because you don't know that long-term you're not going to get COPD from e-cigs or from vaping, do you? Well, we've got a pretty good idea. Um, you and I have both worked the same circuit in our times, and, and certainly as a sound engineer, I've been sat at the side of the stage with all of the, the stage hairs, you know, the, the fog machines. Mm. It's the same stuff. And I've had, I've been at gigs where there's been two gallons of the stuff pumped past my head. I've been breathing it in, and this is long before e cigs were uh, invented. And I must have breathed four or five times what I would get from e cigs mm. in and out. And, you know, I'm walking about and breathing at the moment and, and testament to the fact that these things work and work well. I mean, let's face it, anything that's going to get a 60 a day man, and I'd cut down from 100 a day, anything that's going to get a 60 a day man into, into not smoking cigarettes has got to be a good thing. There's no way can they be as bad for you as cigarettes purportedly are. Dave, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, David Dunn from Sunderland, uh, who is uh, is big in the vaping community. It's the next step on from uh, e-cigs. I mean, he said, you know, he was smoking 160, uh, not 160, but 100, and then 60 a day. And these things have weaned him off. So he made a pretty good defence of why he thinks it shouldn't be an issue if people smoke e-cigs. Weatherspoons aren't the only company to ban these electronic cigarettes. Man City fan was handcuffed, banned from the Etihad Stadium. I'm sure it happened at St James's Park, but I might be wrong. Some airlines have banned them too. <gasps> that would be the worst thing, wouldn't it? You're on a flight to Australia, you can't use it. Ah, Is it fair? Is it an infringement of liberty? Yes, it is. Should <laughs> No. Should e-cigs be banned in public places? What do you think? We're talking about whether electronic cigarettes should be banned, just like the real ones. Uh, some companies are already doing it. Martin Dockrell, he's head of policy for anti-smoking group Ash. You'd think they'd object to anything that contains nicotine and looks a lot like smoking, wouldn't you? But when I asked Martin this morning for his take on e-cigs, I was quite surprised by his response. Well, it's really important that you don't confuse uh, these products with real cigarettes. When you're smoking tobacco, uh, you're doing all sorts of uh, harm to yourself, but in this case, there's no tobacco and there's no smoke. They just aren't com comparable. Should they be banned in public places? Well, some organisations uh, think they should. The British Medical Association, for example, thinks it should. Uh, we don't think so. Um, they certainly aren't covered by the existing law, and we brought that law in to protect people from second-hand smoke. Well, there is no second-hand smoke from these products. Uh, there's nothing to protect people from. If they aren't harming anyone, is it fair to allow businesses to ban them? I mean, you know, there are stories of people being kicked out of pubs or football stadiums. Isn't that an overreaction? Well, now that's a judgment uh, for the owner of the premises to make. There are all sorts of things that uh, you might or might not be allowed to do in a particular environment. And that's you know, in the contract between the customer and uh, the landlord. But uh, as far as health is concerned, now we don't really see that there's a problem in these products. So uh, some health campaigners don't like them because they think they normalise smoking. So what, what's your view at Ash on that? Uh, you could take a view that you see people doing this thing that looks just like smoking and somehow that normalises smoking. Uh, but very quickly, when you see somebody using this, you 
there's no, you can't smell any smoking. You realize that they're not smoking, they're replacing smoking. Uh, so you could equally argue what they're normalizing is replacing smoking. It's just too early to say how this will play out in the, in the long term. I have a brother and a sister who both uh, smoke and they both have electronic cigarettes. Actually, my sister, she's pretty much replaced smoking entirely with uh, these things. So, yeah, great. Is she giving up, though? Well, she's giving up smoking, um, mm. and that's the important thing. She's carrying on uh, taking nicotine. But, you know, uh, if you wear a nicotine patch or you carry on chewing uh, nicotine gum, people don't doubt that you've given up smoking. They say, yeah, yeah, you've given up and well done to you. So, great. She still has the thing to occupy her hands. She still has the, um, uh, the nicotine, but she's not smoking. Now, other smokers like these, and unlike other nicotine products that smokers really, I mean, I used to run quick groups, and you'd struggle to get smokers to use enough nicotine. It's not the same with electronic cigarettes. Smokers like them. Martin Dockrell from Anti-Smoking Group. Ash, his sister, doing well on an e-cig, and he seems to approve. There you go. That was a sea change. Martin Dockrell from Ash. Got it. He is the policy director. Ash gets it. Ash is with us. That's what I took out of that. Jerry, what do you make of what he said? We've got two minutes. That's brilliant. That's just, um, you know, that's worth writing down and blast, plastering all over websites. That's the strongest support yet from Ash. I mean, they've had a very good briefing on electronic cigarettes, but he was just talking such a lot of sense. It was music. It was great. It's, it's been music to my ears and for everybody's benefit, it's already on YouTube. I'll release it as soon as the show's finished so that you can, you can send it wherever you like. Um, yeah. That's just, that thrilled me when I heard that and I wanted to hold that to the back of the show. I hope everybody's enjoyed it. Sav, anything more from chat before we disappear? I've got squillions from chat but no time to read it so I'm going to narrow it down to two comments. Um, Monomax says... All of the joy and none of the death. I feel the T-shirt coming on. <laughs> and the last comment from chat tonight has to go to Swifty McTavish, who says, Dave Dawn, you are a legend. I want your babies. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. I, I really don't. I really don't. Um, thank you, Swifty. And, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I hope you found the show interesting, informative, educational, and above all, uplifting um i've had a great day today outside of the bingo um but now is time i'm afraid we've got to end end the show um all in favor against abstentions it's carried bye bye everybody jerry thanks for joining us it's a pleasure um and until we see you tomorrow night on the here's hour from jerry from sav from myself from all of the team here at v vt tv thanks so much for joining us You've been brilliant. Um, so like I say, uh, we've, got to, we've got to run the credits. See you next time. Take care. Bye.